Welcome to the Real People, Real Business Show. My name is Stephanie Hayes, and I'm a business strategist who helps experienced business owners design asset-based business models that set them up for growth and exit. I love to speak with like-minded entrepreneurs to share their real stories and the gritty details on how they've navigated their own way through. On this show, you won't hear about the glamorized entrepreneurship journeys that you see online, and you won't be told how to make six figures in six weeks. Instead, you can expect to hear real, vulnerable, and inspiring stories that you can relate to that have helped create the foundation for each of our guests' businesses. Today, I'm so excited to welcome Donna Lachlan. Donna is the founder of LMGPR and known for her work with futurists and innovators. She has launched more than 500 companies, taking them from stealth to market leaders since forming her agency in 2002. She's also the host of Before It Happened, a leading narrative podcast featuring visionaries in the moments, events, and realizations that inspired them to change their lives for the better. Donna excels in the realm of storytelling and uses those skills to propel new companies into the mainstream. Welcome to the show, Donna, and thanks so much for taking the time to tell your story today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I can't wait to hear everything. So start from the beginning. How did you end up where you are right now? Wow. Well, it started pretty young. You know, it was most this time of year, the Girl Scouts are out selling cookies and I was a Girl Scout and I did sell cookies alongside my sisters. But and around that same age, I was working at the family business, publishing and printing business. And I was somewhat of a little, I'm going to say a Nancy Drew investigator, because I thought I was an investigative reporter alongside my uncles. And it was just a really beautiful landscape for learning about printing, publishing, editorial, and news reporting. And so from there, you... There, I took the real path of getting, you know, after high school, went and studied journalism and and had a, a minor in economics. My, my father definitely wanted me to have something to fall back on, you know, so to speak. And so it also gave me a topic. So ultimately... My first reporting jobs were working in the business seg- segment of major papers. I, I did internships at the Washington Post in D.C. I did an internship uh, at the Chicago Tribune. And then I worked in the world world for Reuters, now Thomson Reuters, as a news reporter studying business, basically reporting on business economics and eventually technology. And then I had a short stint out of the country working for the BBC and doing the opposite reporting on things that are all things in America, but back in the UK. And so that was kind of my tour duty. Literally, it was like Gary, you know, lived in a knapsack, constantly on the road, didn't, couldn't have a dog, couldn't have a cat, any, any pets or anything that required me, you know, to be home a great deal of time. But it did give me kind of the, the experience that I needed to ultimately, you know, get eventually a desk job, which is very uncommon in the editorial world. But brought me back, the entire tour brought me back to the San Francisco Bay Area where I grew up and got my master's degree and then jumped really deep into the technology sector. As you do in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the, agriculture is is still a huge impact and an economic power, but technology, you know, would be in the convergence of technology and agricultural you know, is something that's been happening, you know, lately in the last 10 years, we're seeing more of that convergence happening. So kind of like back to old school, when I grew up on the apricot, you know, ranch, and there was miles and miles of, of cherry orchards and walnut and, and vineyards. A lot of that's gone away from the immediate Silicon Valley. But it's interesting mm-hmm. that the convergence of the two worlds are meeting again. And so that's pretty exciting to see. So you were involved in and, you know, in just immersed in the technology world and in reporting. And then when did the agency develop? Yeah, so I was on the independent side for about prior to me 10 years working for other companies. I had no clue what I was doing when I started in tech, to be honest with you. I was a I was a reporter and got recruited to work in public relations and it was the opposite of what I thought I'd ever be doing. And, and a lot of editors will will say that as well. It's like, oh, the dark side. 
But what I found is that the people that I was going to be working with also came from the journalism side. So to be a good public relations communication cater, you need to you know be write well, you need to speak well, and you also need to be a good problem solver. And so it, this, the team that I joined, they had all those ingredients plus more. And so once I realized that I didn't need to be the expert on technology, that the engineers and the founders and the and the the innovators were the experts. I just needed to help kind of carve out their stories. So I did that for 10 years with various companies. And then my real raw story, I like to call it my my Dave's Keller bread story. I don't know if you're familiar with Dave's Keller bread, but I think it's a really great product. But when you read the label and you go online and you read the story, you go, oh my gosh, what a story. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it and look it up. But he was literally a hardened criminal went to prison, but when he went back to his family roots, baking bread, I don't break bread. So my raw story was I took a job with a company. I left a, a nice vice president of cu corporate communications position. I took a job with a smaller competitor. They threw a lot of money at me and they threw a big opportunity. And I had been at the other company for about almost four years. So I got wooed. I was they courted over, joined, and within three months, they lost their funding. Oh. And when you lose your venture capital funding, that's not a good thing, which not only meant myself, but the 300 some employees that were at this, this early stage company were all going to be laid off. They gave me a severance package. They really didn't owe me one, to be honest. I hadn't been there terribly long. Other people had been there for several years. I was delighted because it was 2002. We were in a recession. The economy was just coming out of the dot-com bubble. It was not a good time to be, be let go. And I remember walking to my car with the check that they gave me for the three-month severance going, I need to last size this. This really was a reality check, right? This is not just a check. It's a reality check. I need to last size this. I'm going to go deposit it the bank. But when I got in the car, I had another quick inkling, which was like, crap, what am I going to do? I am so, you know, programmed to go to work and to, you know, work, you know, smart and, and, and five days a week and sometimes six days a week. It's just, it was in my DNA. I love work. I, same way I love being a student, but I just, you know, put everything into it. And so before I can even think about the disappointment and fear and uncertainty, I literally just started driving to the business license office in Silicon Valley, not really knowing exactly what I was going to do. And I remember glancing before I started the car, I opened up my purse, I had my phone at a half charge. I said, I better charge my phone and make some phone calls along the way. And then I looked at my wallet and I had $5. Now, I had more than $5 to my name, but I only had $5 in my wallet. And I think at the point I was thinking, should I go get a cup of coffee? Should I stop by Starbucks? Should I go see a friend? Nope, I just drove. Something just told me to drive. And it was about maybe seven miles to the business license office. And I think I had 30 minutes before they closed. And I got there. On the way, I called a venture capitalist that I knew from a prior company that I worked for. I called an editor that I trusted and knew for some time. And I called one of my former employers, not the one I left, a prior one. <laughs> and by the time I got to the business office and parked, and it's funny, ironic, parking was $5. So they got my $5 in my pocket. I went to the business license office and I see this literally look like a manifesto of all the different types of business and the codes. And I scanned it and I thought, I don't really know, like I'm not an L salon. I'm not an auto mechanic. I'm not this. They really didn't have anything that was public relations or marketing specific. It was just consulting services. And so I had a conversation with the woman and she was very nice. But while I was talking to her and filling out the form, my phone started ringing. And the people that I called in the car that I didn't reach immediately were all calling back saying, great, I'm glad you're available. I have a project for you. By the time I left the license, getting my license, filling out my form and, and walking out, I had three projects. 
And my value all of a sudden went up to $15,000. And you mentioned, you know, this is not a, a, a podcast about $100,000, six figures in six weeks. I was just elite, you know, elated because I'm like, I felt like I'm valued, right? I have felt self-worth, like I actually had something to do tomorrow. By the time I woke up the next day, because I made a few more phone calls on the way home, I've gone up to $50,000 in projects. And that's when I realized I am not looking back in the rear view mirror. Something was saying the door swung open and I needed to seize, seize the opportunity. The other thing that was happening in that period of time because of the recession is that there were a lot of people that were unemployed or had been unemployed already. And that also meant that there was a lot of available talent and there were a lot of working moms that were no longer doing job share that were home. So within the first 90 days, I tapped into, went to Craigslist. At the time, Craigslist was like the place to go find talent and went to Craigslist and posted an ad that I was looking for part-time media relations, writing help. And my first two team members were stay-at-home moms with young kids that couldn't work full-time, but they were available about 15 to 20 hours a week. And they were with me for more than 10 years. That's about the time that I think, I remember thinking quite a bit about that too, thinking, gosh, this is an untapped resource of these, these talented, educated, amazing women who are still unable to find meaningful work because you know they've had children or they're part-time and they, they they're not willing to you know jeopardize that relationship with their kids right yeah absolutely well and to kind of go from now i'm starting my quote little infant business right if, literally off my dining table and within the next 18 months i adopted two children and then i thought Oh, I really don't know how to balance all this. At least I thought I knew because, you know, I wasn't a mother, but the fact that I had other women working with me that were mothers, they already had those skills down packed. And so we, we had a little bit of a joke that, that it, my agency name is Laughlin Michaels group, LMG. And our joke was it was loving mothers, good PR, but it really stands for leadership, momentum, and growth. I love that. And I, you know, that those little cultural things inside of these organizations is really what has always made startups so interesting to me. You know, they 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 build a really, really firm culture within. And that's what keeps, you know, everybody sort of in momentum. So you build your team, you found the opportunity, and then what happened? So by the time I got to 2010, there were about 10 of us. So we went from being kind of a cottage home-based business to a, a boutique agency. And we were working on, at the time, cybersecurity was a really big topic. It's still a big problem and it's a big topic, but we were we were known as being the cybersecurity agency. Like if you wanted anyone to work on your cybersecurity and, and your deep data center infrastructure, you, you called us. So there were a lot of bigger agencies, but that was our specialty. And over time, security got immersed into other products. So in into our homes under IoT and to our cars, right? Smart cars, smart homes. So our we started differentiating and expanding ourselves out more. We started having clients that were outside of the San Francisco Bay Area in, in Europe and South America, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Australia. So within the first 10 years, it was pretty exciting. It was also heck of scary at the same time because all of a sudden, you know, I have these young children that are in elementary school. And then I have this other family that my my work family that I was responsible for as well. And so having being able to have constantly have an eye out looking for business. A lot of our business and, and still to this day is referral based. It comes from venture capitalists or prior clients that we worked with. Sometimes we have clients that are kind of, you know, repeat business, but it it was fostered in a whole other set of, when we talk about, you know, reality is that at the time reality TV shows were really booming and, and having the safety network of your team and knowing that I wasn't doing it alone, you know, was really rewarding. 
Also being able to be empathetic to our clients, knowing that I was that person with $5 and a half a tank of gas and started my business. So that our, a lot of our, our emerging earlier clients were faced in that same scenario. Do I downgrade the dog to a cat? Do I mortgage my house? Do I sell my car? I mean, I could really, I could really relate to them. So important. And I think a lot of small businesses serving small businesses, it's it's a, almost a perfect scenario because you've got, you know, that understanding. And I think when you see, you know, I've been in boutique consulting agencies and I've owned my own boutique consulting agency that is serving big corporate. And there's an element of that for sure that where, where those two can work. But I love that that synergy of being a small startup and understanding that you're serving small startups, sometimes bigger, I'm sure, but that that sort of alignment is really important, isn't it? Yeah, well, we worked with a number in, 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 in this last year as well, publicly traded companies as well. And we do a lot of company launches or bringing com- products to market, but we've also helped companies go through IPO. So that oscillates and changes the textures of things very quickly. And then we've had companies that we were so good at where we, what we did, they got acquired. And then it's like, oh, why did why were we so brilliant with that, right? And and so now fast forward 20 years, looking back at our portfolio and where we've, where, you know, the other places we can go and Dr. Seuss's, my, one of my favorite books is they just kind of imagine the, the possibilities. I look back when the types of clients that we were working with when I first started and where we are now, we're working with autonomous, working artificial intelligence, we're working with robotics, we're working with, you know, electric vehicles, tractors, electric cars, electric motorcycles, and the the need to, you know, have the back end understanding of how deep learning and insight and security and intelligence, all these things over time have all just continued to converge, which keeps it exciting. It also you know, working with, you know, with the entrepreneurial and really understanding, you know, the the legacy of where they've come from. There is a lot of fear in in creating, you know, t- leaving your corporate job. I spoke to somebody recently, and they left, you know, their their job at Boeing, a very secure aerospace engineering position, to create his own his own business to follow his passion. And I think that's, you know, very important. I followed my passion at the time when I happened, I didn't know that's exactly, I never, if you had told me you're going to start your business in 2002, I'm like, no, I want to do three more IPOs. You know, I I really, I I enjoyed working in, you know, hands-on in the corporate world, but I, I had that experience and I, I think I just kind of needed that shove. Yeah, it's always, that's always it, isn't it? Like we, maybe we're not quite mentally there yet or haven't made the decision that something happens. And then you just go, like I started up my first business a month before I gave birth to my first kid. I mean, like that's not ideal, but wow. it just, it's just that's what a double happened. infant starter. Oh, listen. Yeah. We could have a whole other episode on that. So you've, you've been running the agency and you're also creating like a platform for the disruptors, for the innovators. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, it's really comes down to what I call the narrative story engine. It's kind of funny because I love cars. Like my joke is I, I like slow food and fast cars and I, I have worked with a lot of transportation. The narrative story engine basically is a dashboard for creating stories. And so our goal is for is not to be press release dependent, but to actually create stories. So common stories are the founder stories, the, you know, the, the there's lots of product stories, David and Goliath, purpose-driven stories. But what we do is go through the process and look for every case scenario, right? So, and that requires going through a discovery process. Sometimes I'm talking to you know, a, an innovator and they're just so passionate about what they're bringing to market and they have their PhDs and they just have all this lab experience, but they're going to take them all the way back to their childhood. Cause I want to know when that curiosity first happened, was it in, you know, was it, you know, with, with a, a robotics fair or were they playing with Legos or whether they read a book or what, or was it a, you know, did they have some mentor and really understanding what that is. And, they, and it's no different for men or women. There's no gender driven 
stories sometimes there there are I, I find with when I work with women that maybe like myself I I, I went math was considered kind of gender-based. So like, what is gender-based math? I was told I couldn't be in the boys' math class. And I thought that was ludicrous. And now today you see what kids are doing in, with STEM education and there's the boundaries are just, there are no boundaries, right? And it's unlimited. But taking them, you know, discovery process and really exploring exactly some of the things that I call your kind of your unique thumbprint. So what's unique to you? We're all born with a story, whether we like it or not. Our, our, you know, I always like to say we're, we're all born naked, but we all have a story that comes with that from our family, from our zip code, the surrounding areas, the environment. But then as we start evolving, we start getting influenced by other things. And that could be education. It could be, you know, popular culture, the city, the country, the state that you live in. And be honest with you, until I started sitting down and writing my own book, I don't think I fully even understood my full story that I that I, I started to share with you, which was when I was a kid, how important that was, how how much that influenced me. And so my authentic origin story is very unique. Most people who run a PR agencies and study journalism, English, or some liberal arts. And they likely they would, you know, journalism or they went straight into PR. But the fact that I actually walked in to nationally acclaimed media houses with a resume when I was 18, then I had I had 10 years experience is not the norm. <laughs> no, I and would so, say not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the norm. In fact, yeah, it was not the norm. So the discovery process is really important. The other is to look at all the elements outside the things you can control. So when, it, when you look at a company, you look at the company assets, the people, their IP and all those components. You look at the product and you look at, you have to look at the competition because that could challenge you. And you also have to look at the trends and things that are happening. So in the example, in the autonomous car world, the ADAS world in which is a big market, a few years ago, that really wasn't a trend story, but it's a really big trend story now. And there's lots of talk about it. And I think it's because there's more reality and 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 companies like Tesla have made it more tangible for people to be able to say, oh, okay, that car, you know, it's a smart car and it has these capabilities. But 10 years ago, it wasn't a trend story. And so my job is to help kind of thread those, look for those stories. And then we have to make sure once we create those, those types of stories, that they have some agility to it because without having, you know, I'm going to say the elastic pants, elasticity to them, the story might get a little tight or it might get a little old. And then you have to, you know, kind of revisit and re embellish it. And you know, so for example, you know, founder story doesn't have all the working components until the product or service ships. And when the product and service ships, then you have to keep an eye on everything that's related to that. And so to me, it's a lot of fun. It's, you know, it's it, it's not just a one size fits all scenario. It's each company and each founder and innovator has their own unique story. And it's really about bringing that to life. I love that you talk about the people, right? And I think that that's what's always been really interesting to me too, is that, you know, everybody we have on the show is, a business owner it's in some way or another and they are all very different people but i feel like there's potentially a thread that is common amongst anyone who's willing to take to take this on and go the distance and persevere and what have you so have you noticed or can you pull out of all of the stories that you've you know been involved in what what are the threads of these of these disruptors what are what's common amongst them uh, well, there's there's a common thread of just being bold and fearless. I think you know you have to you you have to really have passion or purpose or be able to like leave your job, right, and leave that safety net of, of having you know a, a paycheck. I think the other is the ability to want to change, you know, solve a problem. 
So the problem solving component, so Damon Motors as an example, is an electric high performance motorcycle. The founder of the company is an avid snowboarder and was working in the Whistler area of Canada. And he saw the news and you know about the the few the the fuel feuds that were happening in the in the Middle East and continue to happen to this day, right? He thought, well, what can I do to change that? And that wasn't his, you know, his expertise, but it became his passion and his drive of ultimately working in the transportation EV space and then eventually establishing a, a motorcycle company. And so that particular moment in time, that snapshot when someone says, I think I need to fix this. And so I've seen that over and over and over again. Another great example is I work with night scope crime fighting robots. They're autonomous data machines and they help law enforcement and city municipalities reduce crime. The CEO and co-founder of the company, he came from Ford Automotive. He didn't know anything about crime. He was a he was a transportation automotive guy. But when he teamed with someone else who came from the law enforcement side, who the two of them actually had all the collective DNA that you could to bring this pro solve this problem and bring the product to market. But it was because of the shootings in schools, particularly the Sandy Cook shooting, that they realized somebody needs to do something and we have the call to do it. And sometimes I think we all we think about when I was talking about doors swing open, you're thinking, why did that door just swing open for me? Right. Have you ever had that moment where an opportunity is presented to you and you just meet somebody in such a random place and you're just not quite sure? Was this an opportunity or is this like a you know sliding door moment? And I think that's one of the things that I've seen constantly with the the visionaries in passion is that they 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 have these moments or these glimpses into like the future and they want to change. So agent of change and and tackling a big problem. I think the third one is is just this unstoppable, relentless, but humble approach to tackling that problem. That you can't have an ego and and slay dragons at the same time. You just do it. Oh, I love it. I, that's that's the quote of the day. You can't have an ego and slay dragons at the same time. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I used to have this theory in, in particular, you know, people constantly showing me their their gadgets. And I'm like, do I need that? Do I want that? I'm actually kind of a late adopter. I like to wait to see things kind of, you know, iron themselves out and let the price drop. And, you know, this, I get that from my father because, you know, it's like, dad, can we get a, you know, a video recorder back when they were like the rage? No, wait till the prices drop. And every year the consumer electronics show is, is literally like a, is like a, a, toy store for all these consumer electronics. But for me, it's like, okay, just wait for the price to drop. I think the other thing that I'm excited about is that, you know, women and you know, like yourself, like you went out on your own and you created your business and I did too. There's fewer women that, that venture out to do that. But I think there, I think the next generation, the, the generation Z, my daughter's generation is they seem to be more, more fearless than even some of the millennials that I work. And I think generationally, there might be some nuances there. I, it's kind of a wait and see. I don't want to trivialize anything, but I, I think it has to do with the fact that the kids that are going, that are in college, that are coming out, that are in the, you know, the, the Z era, they were the ones that have always been connected and always had access to STEM related activities, after school robot programs and computers and, and more, uh, and I say just more access, more access, access. We have excess as well, as you know, not just access, but excess. And I think as, as a parent, it's really important to set some parameters and, and boundaries of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. I mean, I didn't allow my kids to go all you can eat buffet, you know, searches and and TikTok and Snapchat and that stuff. But by the time they got to teenage teenagers, it's a little harder to control. Totally. And I think that that comes down to the the age old question around, you know, what what are you are you policing them or are you educating them? And I, I think that's the 
you know, I, I remember, you know, that sort of tipping point with my kids where I realized that it, it, I'm no longer here to tell them what to do. I'm here to keep them safe. And if they don't keep themselves safe, then I'll step in and tell them what to do. Right. And yeah, so that's, well, smart and safe. Right. And that was my yeah. message to my kids was you need to be smart and safe. And I remember I almost fainted when I saw that my daughter <clears> created <throat> a Instagram account and she put her first name and her last name and her address, the physical address of where we lived. And I'm like, you can't do that. <laughs> and it wasn't, it was, you know, it was out there. And I said, what's yeah. the password? She couldn't remember the password. I said, we need to get this down. It took me a bit to, to make it happen. But I, I think, you know, going that in the world of, you know, constantly being connected, it's, it's okay to be unplugged. I have to unplug. And I think that's important. I had this conversation with a founder a couple of weeks ago. And I said, when was the last time you unplugged? He going to remember. It wasn't even during the holiday season. He wasn't unplugged. The other one I have is look up. Look above the waist. Look at the world. There's amazing things that are happening. So changing tax just a little bit in your own business, because you're a business owner, what has worked for you or what has growth meant for you? What's changed? I think now the most important thing for me is is choices and being able to choose the right business based on the opportunity. The you know is it a emerging market, not a me too opportunity product. The founder's passion is very important in integrity and ethics and how we bring it to market. So I don't do vanity public relations. I don't do anything that you might see on a reality or Kardashian type thing. That's not what I do. I leave that to Hollywood. But so it's very important to have the transparency and understanding and knowing the inside out of the company, not just the 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 product and how it works and it looks, but what's the customer feedback? What are the partner opportunities? What's you know what's down the pipeline engineering wise? Do you need more funding? The talent that you know that's collectively in the team having access to not just the C suite but to the experts within the different groups. So whether it be marketing or engineering or in sales, I'd like to come in and operate very horizontally. You know with the, with an organization. So I really understand the company inside out. And I think that's one of the things that makes you know a unique approach because we are a boutique, so we can operate like one of your team members, plant myself in your office if needed, or we work, you know, we work remote. But I think having that for me, it's being able to say it's hard to say no, but I do say no, no frequently now. I didn't used to say no. I used to say yes to everybody. If they were thirsty and they had a product and they wanted to you know, bring it to market and, you know, and that's the way to grow the business. But then I also learned that and I, and by taking the, making the wrong choices and taking the wrong business and the wrong business would be something that maybe doesn't absolutely match our skill set or an impossible goal, which is the budget restraint, somebody who wants to doesn't want to spend, you know, $10,000 a month, but they, you know, if they want $10,000 worth of service or 20,000, then they want 40,000. And so just really being able to gauge the expectations as well. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think that's one of the most, the, the critical sort of turning points we all reach in our businesses is understanding what we, we do want, but also understanding what we really don't. And and it's okay to to turn some of that down and and almost wish that some of those I remember being in that position where I would almost I'd get on a call and I'd wish that maybe this person doesn't want to go forward and that's okay <laughs> you know what I mean and so I think that well, that's a level of maturity right that we get to yeah I think it's 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 you know there's two things that immediately came in my head when you said that it's a little bit like a french you know a meal like you know it's all about quality and not quantity right so I wasn't joking when I said I like slow cooking and fast cars. I much rather have a really nice, you know, filet of you know salmon and some vegetables and something that's quite elegant and nice and substantial than a big old, 
you know, hamburger or something. And I think that's the, that's those choices. I think the other thing that came through in my head, you know, was almost like a, 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 a billboard, you know, a big neon billboard is that we as business owners need to be selective. Everybody's not going to be our, our, our perfect match, you know? And so having a billboard on the side of a road would not do my business any justice because not everybody is, you know, is a prospect. And the same way with, with, with dating, if you look like, you know, business relationships and, and, and dating and, and matching, I had this conversation with somebody recently and I said, well, you don't need everyone to say yes. You just need to have the right person to say yes. And, and, and the, always on hyper swipe left, right world that, you know, some people are in, they want a yes every time. I think, why do you want a yes every time? Because it's okay to say no. Yeah. It's that, it's that fried addiction. green tomatoes. I did. did. Seen, and that movie and Kathy Bates goes into the parking lot mm-hmm. and she said, I'm older and I got more insurance. Maybe, maybe it's a little bit of that. <laughs> I would never have thought of that reference at all. And I'm also not much of an authority on dating because I'm not very successful at it. So I'll let, let the, the metaphor stand. So I have I nicknames have a- for all of them. I Like in the office, we came up with joking names. So there's a Bumble is called Fumble. <laughs> and Tinder is called the Great Pretender. And we just, we gave them all funny names just for fun. Oh, I don't, I don't, I, I retired myself from, from apps a long time ago. <laughs> so we're coming up on the end of the show, but I have a question that I ask all of, all of my guests and I, I would love to hear your, your thoughts as well. What's the difference between what we hear out there in the business world and the online business world and all of the, you know, the, the, the stuff that, that is constantly being, you know, spread What's the difference between what we hear out there and what's real about being a business owner? Well, it's it's not a, a in, it's constant. <laughs> but for me, it's seven days a week. And I think when I first started, people like, oh, you're going to have so much free time. I, I think I have balance. I don't think there's such thing as, you know, with glass ceiling and being able to have but I think it's it's more, you know, a, a balancing act of agility. I, I can prioritize what's important to me. When my, my kids were little, they were my they were a priority. I would get my kids to school. I would go to work. I'd go pick them up. And then I would work again later. And I think that was just because my those were my priorities. Now, like, you know, my daughter's in college and, I you know, she's independent agent. So I have a lot more time. But now I'm using some of my time that I would have I would spent and some of the clients that I didn't want to work on and writing my book or in my podcast. So I think that gives us the freedom to make choices of where we spend our extra time. The hardest thing is to, for me, is to totally unplug and take a, a vacation. A what? I don't, a vacation? What? I don't like it. Exactly. <laughs> so I don't, you know, I, I mean, I take, I, I think I take like, people take micro naps. I take micro vacations. Like yes. a three day weekend to me is a vacation. Yeah. And I, you know what I, I have, I think it's only in the last year I have gotten quite diligent about just my weekends being work-free because no, we're not saving lives, right? Like nobody's going to die if I don't work on the weekend. And it's, you know, it's, it's really sort of shifted my perspective. There are weekends that I sit there and I'm like, I don't know what to do. (laughs) I don't know how to fill my time. And I, I kind of just wander around. I must look like a zombie or something. Take a walk. I mean, that's what I do. It's been in doubt. I take a walk, take the dog out. And she looks at me like going again. And I'm like, yeah, we're going out for a walk. In the pandemic, I think that was one of the things that I really made sure I was factoring in because I didn't have the the in-person engagement and the frequency that I was used to going to meetings, yeah. getting dressed up, putting heels. I would still put my heels on and walk down the hallway to my office. And my daughter was like, mom, what are you doing? So I'm going to work. And she was, but she just walked down the hallway. I said, I know, but I have to, I have to like, we, I have to think, put myself in the mindset that I'm operating a business, even if it was at home. And then also force myself to take these micro breaks because getting out and walking the dog is therapeutic. It's good for me. It's good for her. 
Yeah. And so I think when you, when I say it's constant, it's also constantly, I always feel like I'm challenging myself that I am on the verge of excellence. I'm about ready to create something big. And I, I know that when I worked in a corporate environment and I've actually gone to some companies for meetings that were partners with one of my clients and they're like really big companies, I get a little itchy because I don't think I would have the freedom to color outside the lines. And so being, I think being independent and into your own business gives you that freedom. Like a kid, when you were little and you could just run outside and play till the sun set. You don't get that in the corporate world, but it's not for everybody either. So no, uh, no, it's it, true. It, it, and you can't just create a business just because, you know, you, you think you're not going to go to work because there's a lot of work involved. No, but I think that I think that the difference that we're is that we're looking for choice, right? We're looking for the ability to choose whether I do this or I do that. And it doesn't mean that we work less. It just means that we get to decide. And I, to me, that's the number one value. And it's the number one thing that will always, I'm unemployable, right? I, yeah. I've been on my own for so long that I can't even imagine, but I work with Well, my joke is either I, you can hire and fire yourself daily, right? <laughs> or you're yeah. either really good at being gainfully employed or you are unemployable. <laughs> that's me. I'm, I'm fully unemployable. And I work within, when I do corporate consulting, I'm working within a very rigid corporate environment. And it's nice to be the consultant that comes in because I can go home and I don't, I'm not, I, all the rules don't apply to me, which would absolutely kill me. It would be stifle me. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Well, all right. it- leave it and there's certain things you could just leave on the table and walk away so I don't I, I don't know that yeah yeah and that is worth every bit of financial stability that I have sacrificed over the years and and I think that's what makes us entrepreneurs right we're we're, we're comfortable with that and we're willing to to make that a priority over everything else absolutely I want to thank you for taking the time to be here today can you tell all of our listeners where they can find you yeah, absolutely. my favorite place is LinkedIn. It's just Donna Laughlin and it's L-O-U-G-H-L-I-N. My PR agency is lmgpr.com. And my podcast that I, I host before it happened is just before it happened.com. And excited that we're coming up with a new sub-series called Making It Happen, which is kind of taking a twist. So just talking to the entrepreneurs, we talking to the, the leadership and coach experts that work with the entrepreneurs to help them get to that next level. So venture oh, capitalists that. and branding experts and bookkeepers, accountants, and all those types of people you need to bring your business to market and yeah. excited for that, that new extension. That's amazing because we have amazing stories too, from, you know, working with so many different businesses and so many different awesome entrepreneurs who are doing so many different things. I love it. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. And I am so happy we had the opportunity to chat with Donna today to hear more about how her business came to be, her experiences along the way, and what the future of the business entails. And thank you for tuning into this episode of the Real People, Real Business Show, where we get the real entrepreneurial stories and journeys that you can relate to. The show notes, resources, and links from this episode are available on my website and social media platforms. And if you've enjoyed today's content, I would love for you to give us a review on whatever platform you're on to help us share these genuine stories with an even bigger audience. Till next time, keep building, keep dreaming, and keep being real.